Welcome to the Susan Brender Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your very best. And now, here's Susan Brender. I'm Susan Brender, and this is the Susan Brender Show. Today, I'm very fortunate to have Mardell Hill, who is an internationally published author of Intestinal Health, A Practical Guide to Complete Abdominal Comfort. Now, Mardell, she um, is just produced a book that um, I just mentioned that is a reference book, uh, already a top seller. And um, she's here to talk all about intestinal health and various other things. So I want to welcome to the Susan Brenda Show, Mardell Hill. Hello, Susan. Thank you so much for having me today. My pleasure, Mardell. Now, you are involved in a very, very difficult um, program or, you know, kind of situation. You talk all about people's digestive issues, um, and you're very interested in the last 30 years uh, in the health industry in directly working with people who have these uh, digestive issues, questions, and concerns. So what are the the issues and the questions and the concerns? Yes, I agree. I mean, really what I do is I talk to people about what is so hard to discuss with their families, their friends, even some medical professionals uh, are so aloof with them that they, they feel that they can't really talk about what's really going on inside of them. However, with that said, that 60 to 70 million people a year in the U.S. alone, according to the National Institute of Health, are affected with digestive issues. And this is very alarming, which is what brought me to my book. But let's just go through some of the things that people suffer with that are really common issues. Yeah. And that's gas, bloating, constipation, poor digestion, diarrhea, abdominal acid reflux. I mean, so many people can actually relate to any one of those or they know someone, a friend or a family. That, and mm. This is what people are dealing with, but it's such a shame issue and it's something that people just can't talk to anyone about. So this is a conversation I have with people and support them in, mm-hmm. in whatever way I can. Now, Mordell, what do you think is the cause of this, this big, huge problem? Uh, is it our food? Is it um, stress? What causes all of the uh, issues that you just discussed? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and it is an enigma for people, and they're always asking questions, you know, why is this going on? And some of those are, you know, the broad kind of cliche term is toxins, but if I was to get more specific, we look at environmental toxins, we look at chemical toxins, pharmaceutical toxins, the food we're consuming that contains toxins, or the way we consume it becomes toxic, Uh, the water how clean is your water? And as you mentioned, stress uh, kicks off something called cortisol. And when the hormone cortisol is produced, it actually degradates the immune system. And the immune system is 70% of our digestive tract is our mm. immune system. And most people don't know that. No. So there are so many different things uh, that go into it. Mm-hmm. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the immune system. Um, it it's, seems to be the belief of many people that if they take vitamins and minerals and various things like that, that it will help their immune system. Do you agree or is there a, some other thing that you think they need to do in order to feel better? Yeah, again, these are some of the questions that people don't really understand and are so important to really get this information out. Uh, The supplement taking can be valuable or it can be toxic to somebody depending on how they take it. For example, when people take any sort of vitamins, they need to eat food with it because food is where vitamins are supposed to come from for our body nutrients. And when they take vitamins on an empty stomach, say with their coffee in the morning running out the door, it actually doesn't have anything to adhere to and becomes a toxin in their body and then can cause other issues. You know, there's so much you can go into, which is certain vitamins are non-soluble and some are soluble. And the non-soluble then can collect in the system and have a negative effect on one's health. So 
in that way, if somebody's taking vitamins, taking them correctly can be very beneficial to them and in the right dosage. So it's always a good idea to check with a practitioner uh, in order to make sure that you're doing that correctly. And and the same with supplements, making sure you take supplements correctly Mm -hmm. and only as needed rather than just thinking, if I just take this, I'll be fine. Yeah, Um, that's a great uh, piece of advice because most people, you know, who are suffering, and believe me, based upon the numbers that you told, uh, don't understand uh, how they, what they need to do. And um, unfortunately, uh, companies who advertise, now, before I, you know, say something more, I just want to tell you a little story. Um, I started to talk uh, in a show that I was hosting at some point about uh, McDonald's. And I uh, interviewed at that time another um, person who's involved in health, digestive health. She's a nutritionist and um, and also a dietitian. Um, Maudine Nelson is her name. Now, Maudine said that um, it's so very difficult to, uh, when you have places like McDonald's, you know, they um, they can spend millions of dollars on advertisements, millions. And so if you want to try to to make sure that people eat well, very difficult. Because how do you fight a company who's got millions of dollars and who can advertise that? Any thoughts on that uh, story? Yes, she's absolutely correct. This is This is an ongoing problem in our society and goes back to when I had discussed about what's causing the problem, that was one that has to do with food that is processed, chemicals, et cetera. Um, I don't care where you purchase the food, whether it be at a, a large box store or um, at the gas station uh, convenience store or at McDonald's. If it's containing many chemicals and it's been over-processed, it doesn't have the nutritional value we need So it becomes a vacant food that goes into us. And again, going back to it is often not even chewed properly and and processed properly in the body. So it becomes non-nutritional. And hence, people end up not getting fed the nutrients they need for those reasons, that they're not only not chewing it, it's not being processed, and also that it is vacant food. Um, Many times when people are overweight, they're actually starving to death. Mm. Uh, they, they're they not getting fed and they're thinking, I've got to lose weight. It, you know, that kind of feeds back to what you had uh, mentioned about people taking supplements to make mm. themselves well so they eat McDonald's and drink sodas or, or whatever that is for them. Uh, they don't chew their food properly and then they think, well, I'll just go on a diet and I'll it and everything will be okay. Mm-hmm. Well, in my book, I discuss something that relates to that, and it's what I call the push-pull. Okay. So when people want to make a change, the change has to come from a simple process, not unlike a stagnant pond, for example, and you want to push in good to change your habits of what's going in orally, into the mouth, the way you chew it, the way you process and then that initiates digestion properly, and then you have to pull the plug on the other side. You can't just keep pushing good onto stagnation and expect to get a change. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And it it brings me to the point of um, food. So what are the best food choices um, that that you can handle? I mean, you must know the foods that make people not only feel good but are healthy for them. Yes, yes. It's, you know, there's there's difference in the foods you can eat at your home versus at restaurants versus at social functions. So when you're picking foods, it really comes down to looking at color. Uh, that's the easiest way to say it. So if you're at the grocery store or if you're at a social function or a restaurant, you think of how do I pick food that has color in it? It's greens, it's red bell peppers, it's carrots, it's uh, salmon, um, nuts perhaps, things that have color in them rather than a plate that has bland colors mm. with breads and whatever. The, the bland colors are usually foods that don't have a lot of rich 
nutrients in them. So, for example, it might be yams over potatoes. However, potatoes are good, but yams are going to give you more nutrients. Mm -hmm. Salmon is going to give you more nutrients uh, than, say, a chicken or a steak. Uh, All are good. It's just making a better choice. And if you're at a a picnic, same thing. If you're at um, at a function, the other note I want to make is making sure everything's at the right temperature. Mm. When I say that, that means that your meats are fresh off the grill, that your uh, any products that you're having that should be chilled are kept on ice because you can become ill and upset your digestion just by consuming something that's supposedly healthy, but it's not kept at the right temperature. Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit more about your book. Um, it's mm-hmm. called Intestinal... Well, let's... let's it, let me give you – well, you tell us about your book. And what's the name of the book again? Right. It's called Intestinal Health, A Practical Guide to Complete Abdominal Comfort, which feeds back to abdominal comfort. Abdominal discomfort is the number one complaint in the U.S. And that is the root of how this book ever came about. I spent – my first nine years in the business of helping people with cleansing and helping people that came in with repetitive complaints uh, about their digestion, they had exhausted all their other avenues of getting testing, of getting uh, medical advice, taking supplements, etc. And then they come and work with me. And over that time of nine years, I heard the same question so many times from so many people, I said, you know what? These people really want answers and they're not getting them anywhere that they're reaching. So what if I, rather than sounding like a parrot, I could actually jot down their questions. Mm -hmm. I could jot down my answers that I say all the time. And then I could start making some sort of a journal. And then they could get those from me. So however that was, it was just my little brainstorming. Mm -hmm. So I actually started this by writing on sticky notes with a pen and sticky notes in my pocket when I would work with people, Mm -hmm. and I'd jot both sides, the question, my answer, and then when they didn't understand, I wrote in an analogy that would help them understand. So I spent all this time then writing these questions, and people couldn't wait to get this book. Mm. So they started getting their questions, their questions. The whole book is written in their questions, exactly. And then I started putting it in lay versions so they could understand. It then evolved. I got a publisher. It doubled in size. It's fully illustrated. And then it became this reference book to somebody hearing from, say, a family member, a friend, or themselves, and they're like, oh, I've got this burning, and they tell me I have acid reflux, you know, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And all they have to do is quickly reference it, and they get it in a short paragraph, a couple of pages. I went on a trip. I got sick to my stomach. What do I do? So I just made it super simple for the average person Mm -hmm. to get the answers they need in just a quick reference. That's a great way uh, to really understand how people are suffering. Um, Now, speaking of suffering, um, you do something called uh, colon therapy. Now, Mm -hmm. tell our audience a little bit about colon therapy uh, because it's, um, well, we all know we have a colon, but what is colon therapy? Yes, so... It's often uh, mistaken for a colonoscopy, and that is not true. A colonoscopy is a medical procedure, just so we get that out of the way. What I do is colonic enemas or colonic hydrotherapy. And what that is is a gentle washing of the colon, which is also the large intestines, and it helps in what I had mentioned on the pull aspect of a push-pull. So just like you brush your teeth and clean out your mouth, it's the other end, 30 feet later, where it's just a gentle washing of the bowels and helping to pull out through a push-pull. You eat the right things, then you allow the debris to move out with assistance of water out the rectum. And it helps to expedite that process of encouraging the good food to go in, nutrient-rich, 
feeding yourself and then allowing the stuff that you don't want anymore to move out at a more rapid pace than trying to take laxatives or high fiber and making yourself possibly uncomfortable. It's just an assisted way of making that process a little easier. Mm -hmm. In all fairness uh, to uh, this issue of um, colonic therapy, um, is there any danger at all? You know, there can be, and that's that's very important for people to understand. Uh, let's just take, for example, if somebody has used laxatives, um, and just so we get the facts up front, laxatives are over a $7 million a year business in America alone. Wow. It is a big overuse issue. When people take laxatives, whether they're prescribed or over-the-counter, when they overuse them, and that's the key, what happens is it, it thins the lining, it degradates the integrity of the intestines, and then that can cause them to be in harm's way if mm -hmm. they get a colonic because the tissue is not strong enough. It doesn't have the correct integrity, and that's one example. Mm -hmm. Another example might be that they're on a lot of medications, and that, again, has compromised liver integrity and then hence maybe they haven't been eating right for a long time. And the, the combination of medications, poor diet, poor health for a long-term or mm -hmm. chronic issues can degradate the tissue to where if they have that back pressure, there can be risks. Right. And so they have to make sure they have full medical evaluations before they do something like this and make sure that they have also prepared their bodies properly mm -hmm. rather than just running in. It's not a band-aid. Now, how about the medical community? How do they view um, this colonic method? You know, it it is uh, something that goes way back into the late 1800s, the early 1900s. Uh, they ceased doing enemas uh, as a way of healing bodies. It used to be the way they'd break fevers and often eradicate infections by doing what was called a high colonic um, however, that ceased when antibiotics came into play in the 30s, 40s, and now it is coming back, but with a hand of caution. Mm -hmm. And so we are recognized. However, we are held with certain standards, which I think are really important, and I appreciate and, and uphold those, and that is so people are safest. And that is goes back to what I said, which is, Really make sure that you're in good health, that you've done your work up front before you go get that done. Make sure you have improved the integrity of your intestines first. That's what the book is about, how to help yourself first, how to maintain your health, and then how to uh, support your intestinal tract mm -hmm. throughout the rest of your life. Now, um, if you look around our country, particularly the U.S., you see so many obese people. I mean, the obesity issue is a really tough one because, um, again, here we are, <clears throat> uh, we're trying to, uh, you know, we're trying to stay healthy, but for some reason, the obesity issue in our country is huge. So what do you say to that? Yeah, uh, wow, that's a big topic. Um, how do I surmise that? Um Again, like I had said, is that oftentimes when people are so overweight, they're actually hungry and they're starving themselves because a lot of debris has collected in their body. The nutrients are absorbed in through the lining of the small intestines, the majority of them are. If that area is impacted in any way or over full, those nutrients aren't really getting through the wall, so how can they be fed, number one? Mm -hmm. Number two is that... If they continue to consume food that doesn't have nutrient value because they're hungry, it only compounds the problem. Then ultimately they can have some diagnosis or dis-ease that starts to happen. They start taking medications. There's this compounding issue that starts happening. They get tired. They'll get bloated. They don't feel like exercising. And it's a perpetual motion of sedentary lifestyle combined with the wrong foods, combined with then they're, then everything just starts slowing down and they, they are stuck mm -hmm. in, in every imaginable way. And it, it's a slow process. When it gets too far, uh, they need to get medical intervention. If it hasn't gotten too far, they can start on a process working with a lot of the points from my book 
and then also working with a process with, say, dietitians or nutritional experts that can help coach them on the right foods and get themselves better prepared. And then as things get under control, they can add something like a colonic. But with that said, most people don't realize they have five elimination organs on their body. They don't just have to get a colonic. They don't have to do enemas. Mm -hmm. This is about utilizing five different organs, the skin, Mm -hmm. the lungs, the kidneys, the liver, and the colon. So the book goes through each one of those and gives all different ways that people can can cleanse their body, for example, in saunas and things. Uh If you're overweight, going back to the obese, you aren't going to feel very comfortable in a hot sweat. Mm -hmm. But as time goes on and you get things under control, that's a way to help cleanse your your skin, yeah. uh, doing uh, exercise that makes you sweat. So it goes on and on from that. There are many different ways that people can um, help their body, and that's what the book points out, simple ways that people can support themselves and start turning it around. One final point on that mm-hmm. is that when you're making turns in your health, don't look at it as, oh, I'll just go on a diet and in 10 weeks I'll drop my 20 pounds and everything will be good. And then I can just go back to my life. This is looking at your life in 10 years. If I keep going on this road, where would I be? If in 10 years I change my direction, where would I be? And that's what I really encourage people is look at it as where you're going to be in your future in 5, 10, 20 years and how that health change is going to affect you in long term. Right. Now, you just brought up the word diet. What do you think about all these diets that are um, on the market today? I mean, there is there is diets that make you eat a lot of protein and get rid of all the carbs. Um, what's your thoughts about dieting? Because it seems that it's a real rocky slope. Um, people seem to lose weight for just a bit of time and then they just get it back so are are do you advocate for diets well <laughs> that makes me chuckle because the first three words i think kind of describe that <laughs> d-i-e um it is implies that it is something that is you implement and then you get to be done with it and i think that there is some great value in many of them because they're actually encouraging a lifestyle change, a a way to eat better. Uh, The shortcoming of it is is that it it has an end point. It's three weeks, it's six weeks, it's whatever it is. There's always an end point. People can't wait to get to that end point. And and then they can get their life back. And and although it may encourage long-term, there's always an end point where whoever is working with them or whatever that diet or, or packaged program is, it has an end point and then the people are not in the mental space of understanding that this is supposed to be something that is a mental change. It's an emotional change. Wow. People eat for emotional and mental and social reasons. And seeing that, those scenarios differently is ultimately the root that has to be planted in order to make that new lifestyle grow and flourish for a long-term goal. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing, this whole diet thing. And I I did, when I was a personal trainer and I worked in post-rehab, um, I worked with people on something that I've written in the book called the 6 and one program. Mm. And I found it to be highly successful. And what that is in a nutshell is that, I would say to my clients, I'd say, I need you to stay exactly on your clean dietary program with adequate hydration and all the right exercise program for six days. I don't care what day you choose, midnight to midnight, you do anything you want. I don't care if you lay on the couch and eat pizza and drink beer all day. I don't care what that is. You do whatever you want on that 24 hours and they would, and some went extreme and some went moderate, but it gave them an end point at the end of the six days that they had their day. Mm. They'd come back to me on day eight, and they were puffy, bloated, feeling lethargic, and then we'd go back on their program for six days, and guess what, Susan? What? In a, I have a matter, 
I know, right? <laughs> On a matter of three weeks, there was a 50% change Whoa. in their own choices on that day off. In a matter of six weeks, they had almost eradicated their seventh day, which is their day off, because they got their own feedback of how they were supposed to eat to make themselves feel better because they were implementing what was making them feel wrong, not me. And then throughout the week, they'd feel better, then they'd make themselves feel worse. So it's a fascinating way of doing it because now they're implementing new programs on their own and seeing their own behavior and how it's affecting them. Yet there isn't some, oh, in six weeks, we'll just stop this, you go back. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes a lot of sense. In fact, um, I've spoken to a lot of people um, about the obesity issue, and and all of them say that you can't stop. Sometimes if you have an urge, I'll give you an example. You have an urge for eating chocolate or having an ice cream or something like that. Um, the, the dietitians and nutritionists always say that you should allow yourself a little, you know, just a little opportunity to to eat the things that may not be good, um, but just once, you know, once a week or once every other week. And then they say, um, but stick to n- not a diet, but stick to having food. Uh, in proportion, don't don't eat a lot, but eat several times a day. Um, is that what you think would benefit people as well? Well, I, I think if people don't know it already, I will reiterate it, is that our metabolism speeds up when we eat every three to four hours. And that is, um, again, the analogy in the book is when you feed a pellet stove a scoop every few hours, you keep the... the fire going as opposed to making a bonfire in the morning and then coming back at night and it's all cinders. If you keep doing every few hours, and I'm not talking about a constant grazing because the digestion has to work and go through its process. So eating your X meal, waiting three to four hours, eating another meal. So eating, depending on what time you get up, four small meals in the day is going to speed up your metabolism. I'm going to go back to chewing It's the number one problem because people have gotten away from that. They gulp their food. Chewing your food is the first process of digest as start your engines in my book. If you chew your food, you start as many as eight digestive processes. If you do not chew your food completely, you miss those digestive processes that are so critical for breaking down your food so it can be absorbed by the time it gets to the small intestine. Mm. The second the second part of that that I wanted to touch on is in relation to how people eat and making their choices and doing little cheats. Mm-hmm. I have put in the book something that's called the intestinal health gist. And the story behind how that came about was because my editor came to me and she says, you know what, Mardell, I eat exactly opposite of you the Diet Cokes, the snacking, the whatever. And you eat so perfectly. And she said, I don't want to be perfect like you. I just want to be better, right? Can you hear people saying that? I just want to be better, but I don't want to be perfect. I don't want to be the extremist, you know, the, the paleo, whatever that is. And she said, so I want a column in your book. I want to see that you can help me to get better, but not have to be so extreme like you. And so we created the intestinal health checklist. It has four columns. I took every imaginable type of food there is, and then I created four columns from what is the worst you could eat in that type of food, say salads or meats or cheeses, dairy, fruits, vegetables, etc. And then I worked it over to fair, better, and best. And then oh, wow. it's like a little chart. Yeah, you can print it off. And you can mark it, and then you can just move over one column. So there's these successes that are personal. This isn't about judging against anybody else. It's not about a program they have to achieve and then end. This is about slowly making improvements on your own with your own chart. Hmm. How very interesting. You know, Mardell, there is so much information that you have to offer. And um, I want to ask you if uh, at some point we can invite you back to continue this discussion. Um, You're an amazing person. Uh, My guest today has been Mardell Hill. She is an internationally published author 
of Intestinal Health, A Practical Guide to Complete Abdominal Comfort. And so, um, uh, Mardell, uh, give us some of the information of how to get the book and uh, what's your website and how do people get in touch with you if they want to, um, of course, uh, get the book and also um, go to your to your spa. Yes, uh, the book can be purchased on many different links and you can find that at www.intestinalhealthbook.com and that will also send you to my website which is bouldercoloniccenter.com you can go to either one of those links I also have a YouTube channel that is under Mardell Hill there's over 50 YouTube videos that are 2 to 4 minute videos that talk to you about a lot of these health tips all of this is also accessible on my website, you can find everything. Again, intestinalhealthbook.com. You can find the videos. You can find a blog. You can find uh, access to my business, phone number, email. Everything is there. A lot of great tips. That's where you get everything you need. And you can purchase the book off of whatever site is appropriate for you. Uh, thank you so very much, Mardell Hill, for being on the Susan Brender Show. You, you are, um, in, in a sense, you're really an inspirational person who um, uses alternative medicine in a way that helps people a lot. So, again, I just want to thank you for being on the Susan Brender Show. You're more than welcome. And thank you so much for having me, Susan. It's been a pleasure. Uh, for me as well. Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. To be a guest, email sebrender at yahoo.com.